file cards in it, you know, like a file folders and all kinds of things in it, and like barely any response. And then when I went on my own to pitch the comic book, it was like an email, uh, who, a phone call up Hasbro, uh, who's at the licensing department to talk to, what's their contact, and said I was interested in making this pitch, sent an email with a proposal, and then mailed in some stuff uh, with like samples of art of like what a few pages would look like and the, ter the terms and samples of the other stuff I published, which were like these black and white comics. And then they responded, so they were interested, and then they sent back, you know, what the deal terms would be and, and just some back and forth emails. And, you know, uh, I didn't bring up that I didn't have like a big office, there was no need to bring that up. But also, I mean, I sent them the books I was publishing. I wasn't pretending to be something I wasn't. You, um, you were a one person, black and white comics, self-publishing, convention driving to yeah. comics publisher, indie yeah. comics guy. Yeah, I mean, I was nationally distributed, uh, but yeah, I was still just driving, you know, to the cons on every con I could get to the weekends, working my day job, publishing comics on the side. And, and you had, and how many employees did you have when you pitched? Zero. The <laughs> yeah. uh, We had a team, it. we had the team in place, uh, I mean, they saw, I think what got them was the art, like um, four or five sample uh, of like what the first few pages of the story would be, um, which I think we were, we redrew them, but they're pretty similar. And it was Steve Kurth. He, there was an artist, Steve Kurth, I went to. I, uh, the story's been told a few times before, but I went to my friend Tim Seeley, who was another artist, like trying to break in and he said, I'm not good enough to do G.I. Joe. <laughs> and he would talk to my friend Steve, who's a little bit older. And then we, he said, cool. I said, hey, I don't have any money, but I'm going to go for this. <laughs> if it works out, you know, we'll, we'll all be involved. And so that, and I got, uh, I think I, I five color design agreed to color the samples. I honestly can't remember. I, I have no idea. I might have colored those myself. But we um, set those in and yeah, that was, that was what landed it. So, but now what I didn't know was, I'm pretty sure from what I've heard in hindsight, uh, like you gotta remember, think again, like nobody had ever done an 80s retro thing yet in comics. And the people in charge all did not understand that like everyone who was like early 20s and younger was like dying for that stuff to come back. And uh, they just didn't get it. And Oh, it was shocked me because in the stores, I, I had just seen like everyone freaking out over like G.I. Joe and Transformers and Ninja Turtle and Voltron and Thundercats t-shirts and stuff back on like Hot Topic and things like that. So, um, Which you had been designing some of. Yeah. For yeah, that I, small company. Yeah. And so I got to see like, hey, this isn't just something I think, this is a proof, this is, this is validated now. Um, but. They were just, they didn't get it. Uh, it wasn't just Hasbro, a lot of people didn't get it back then. Um, but they really didn't get it. And uh, I forget, I lost my train there's of also a little. <laughs> there's also a little bit of context. All right, so um, so we think of Transformers. Oh, I know what's going sorry. Uh, um, I'm pretty sure they, uh, the, the, they, right before I contacted them, that they had taken it to like Marvel to like, you know, and made it maybe been a little too, combination of being a little too cocky, like you're so lucky that like, we're offering this back to you. Um, at the same time, Marvel not getting it and being like, why, why would we want to do this 80s thing? <laughs> like, and, and, or why, you know. So I think I think I might have slid in just at the right time. So we, we think of this 80s nostalgia boom uh, you know, Thundercats came back with some comics in the 2000s. Transformers was really big at Dreamwave, uh, G.I. Joe, Battle of the Planets, some other things. So it's, Masters it's, of the Universe. Masters of the Universe, Universe, thank you. Um, it's important to remember that, that G.I. Joe was the first of these to come back. And also at the time, Hasbro has just come off of a couple years of, of unsuccessful G.I. Joe, no G.I. Joe, or very small, limited G.I. Joe releases at Toys R Us. And Hasbro in 2000 is really focused on Star Wars because they're between episodes one and two. I forgot about that. And yeah. uh, they had just bought um, some 
bought or licensed some video games or like a little video game library or a little video game company. And Hasbro uh, was not focused on something like G.I. Joe. So in terms of sneaking in, and, and here yeah. today, you know, today we're thinking of Hasbro, we're thinking of like the IP and you know, the millions, billions that, that are behind these things and how carefully they sort of like choose to market them in films and, and toys and the success that classified is now, now today. And sort of G.I. Joe, Hasbro, a very different place to that, and sort of the rea reaction that kind of you got was very interesting in terms of like um, uh, uh, you know, asking for things like sto you know story bibles or character bibles. Yeah. Or, what's, what's some of the reactions? <laughs> yeah. The, the, the funniest thing I always talk about is how like the, at first you know, so I think once they gave me the license and realized it was getting traction, it kind of freaked them out because then they realized oh we just gave this unknown kid like the keys to the. Lamborghini <laughs> and the 80s, but I had this really bizarre amount of experience already with licensing because I, you know, just been in, in, just fell into that earlier, and, and I had been self-publishing for years, and uh, so I'm like, do you have you know style guides? Like I, I went looking for like big character bibles. I was ready to for them to receive like all of give me all of the rules like. Here's what you can and can't do in this universe. Here's like the current versions we want you to use, and I'm ready to think like, man, I hope I don't have to like, you know, argue with them over which version of this character to use. And some like the first person I talked to didn't know who Snake Eyes was. So yeah, and, and so like there was no style guides. So I, I was kind of like, well, cool. I could just I'm well because I wanted to like put the team together, pick who I wanted to really focus and bring back. Uh, and then redesign them for what fit into the year, you know, the year 2001, which was basically like, you know, everybody just kind of wanted to see the, the original designs tweaked a little bit and just like made a little more badass, like whatever that meant at the time. Or things like I did make this change, like shipwreck. I just got him out of the old like navy gear, made him more like you know the the blue knit cap and sweater and. Um, uh, Snake Eyes pretty much stuck with that second version. Just put the Arashikagi symbol on his shoulder for the first time and tweaked his like armband and stuff a little bit. And, um, yeah, just, you know. Uh, you didn't just write the opening issues. Uh, you also provided yeah. some art for them. How, how was your, how was that, what was that, what's your writing process? Uh, yeah, so I had always written and drawn all my own stuff uh, or I would always work in some, some collaboration with other people. So I, you know, part of it was necessity, and part of it was like I wanted to put my stamp and my vision on it, and, and then, uh, um, so yeah, design the characters, write the story, and then, but I would do the layouts too. So those first few issues, I don't remember how many issues it was, but I did the layouts before I handed them over to Steve Kurth, and then, you know, from there, you know, he would do everything, and, and uh, he designed a couple of the characters too. Um, uh, over time, and then I think as time went on, it just now we were running, and, and it was more like just his show for and after that. Then the success of the first issue was a great surprise, or was it? How was how did that oh, hit? Yeah. So that was like that was so every single relationship was kind of a weird dynamic. The Hasbro thing was weird. <laughs> first, they didn't understand why anyone would care, and then when they realized everyone cared a lot, then they freaked out that we had the license. But then we were selling really well, you know, and, and so, but then they were also like, they didn't understand the comics market, so they thought like 100,000 copies sold out with a reprint of another 30,000 copies sold out with a reprint of another collection. They thought that was like kind of bad, um, which was at the time was fantastic for, for, <laughs> for comic sales. Uh, so there was that, and then like Image Comics, I signed you know, with them, and I think they weren't really used to doing licensed properties like that and I you know I mean I just grew up idolizing those guys and everything so I was thrilled to be there but I think it even kind of threw off the management there at the time like oh man because they didn't get it either there was like one guy at Image that really I think understood this is going to be big but the main the main management there was like what is happening <laughs> and they ended up putting it on the preview to the cover to the diamond retailer catalog and and uh we had pre-orders of like 70,000 copies, and I, I pushed Image to go ahead and print 100,000 um, 
so we would make sure we had enough in stock. Which they might have and thought was risky. Yeah, they did not want to do that. And then I had to argue like, well, that's my, you know, they just take their flat fee. That's the way that company works. And, and uh, it's, so I was like, well, it'd be my loss anyway if, I, if I'm wrong. And when you're printing 70,000, it doesn't cost much of anything more to print another 30,000. So they're like, okay, fine. And then, uh, yeah, so then we were ready to go. And um, the, uh, and then that was September 11th, 2001. And the book was coming out September 12th. So we did have crazy hype. We had people like in a fervor on the message boards. Wizard Magazine, which was like the Rolling Stone magazine of the, of the era, was covering it. I mean, it was, it was ready, it was pumped, set up to be this big hit. Um, and then, but just the craziest timing, then 9-11 happens. And so the, it's weird, like, you know, it's kind of silly to say that that didn't have an effect on some of the sales, but I, it was like, people were already like amped up. I think it was just changed the vibe the next day when people came in there and there's this big J. Scott Campbell American flag cover. Um, so uh, yeah, but that, that's how it all, the whole thing launched. All right, so you, you're writing a book and, uh, but you also own this company. So I'm shifting gears a little bit here, not just in that first six months or year, but over the, over the, uh, years with the Joe license. Can you talk about um, run, owning and running a business? You, you had employees and freelancers. And yeah. Um, well, I started, well, my first comic book imprint was called Labyrinth Studios in 1996, 97, 98, 99, 2000. Then uh, no one could pronounce or spell Labyrinth. So I was like, I gotta change it to something else. I was working with this like, you know, apparel company and I was like, I'm gonna make like something that just sounds cool, doesn't mean anything. It could be a, a streetwear line, it could be my a art studio, comic studio, a band, even though I don't play music, but it could be anything. And so I came up with Devil's Do. And then I started Devil's Do Studios doing freelance and uh, was planning like, I'm just gonna, I've got enough freelance now to quit my job. I'm just gonna build this up, keep publishing my comics and Five years from now, I'll probably have enough stuff built up. And then decided to make the shot for the license, and that worked. So all of a sudden, you know, um, that new brand name just suddenly had, I, I published one book, Couldn't Have Placed, which was like a black and white book that came out just as Devils Do. And then Image, I mean, the, the deal was already done, and ready to go for G.I. Joe. So like Devils Do was sort of, from from the outside perspective, appears to have been born <laughs> alongside G.I. Joe. And um, I never knew, I don't know what it's like, I never knew anything other though than like, comics is a business, like comic books is a commercial art. And I just through lack of patience, probably as a teenager, since I was like 14, was writing letters to publishers and trying to figure out how to, you know, I was trying to get hired long before I was qualified. And then, you know, right around the time I was starting to get good enough to maybe get hired, I ended up just self-publishing. And then, you know, just kind of never escaped self-publishing. Right, so <laughs> and maybe then started having to add employees when G.I. Joe took off. Okay. Actual so, employees in an office. So though it's a, a big jump to go from just you to renting an office and having employees, it sounds like there's, there's a trajectory that was already there. You were already yeah. a business person. Already, like having to deal with like invoices and purchase orders and understanding that part of it and dealing with the printers, and, but yeah, not not like managing people and having staff and all that. So that was like typical entrepreneur thing of you know, okay, work your ass off and do everything <laughs> until you can start hiring people and and started with a little office like an eight by eight closet and then took over another, like an actual bigger room, and then took over another room in this little building above a 7-Eleven in Chicago. And then, uh, um, I think within a year after that though, we had uh, half a dozen employees. I think at our peak, we were 12 employees with like 50 or 60 contractors at any given time. Um, and, and, and conventions. And, yeah. And so you travel and hustle. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of conventions, a lot of, uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, the, at the peak craziness is when I had to like dial it back just otherwise, you know, you realize you're human and you can't do this all this in mid twenties. 
I've already been running the company for a few couple of years. I'm like, you know, writing four or five books a month, still designing and doing sketches and drawing some stuff, and and managing like all these employees. They all have their own dynamic, and <laughs> and then um, dealing with yeah, just dealing with everything. So and it's, it's sort of getting into the detail of the comics a little bit, and, and given where we are with assembly required with our, our dreadnought. Um, theme, the book itself um, sort of started off with a bang with, with Dreadnoughts being quite a big uh, focus there. You introduced the, the, the character uh, um, of, of Zartan's daughter into the, into the mythos and you also um, had Dreadnoughts declassified um, miniseries. So can you talk a little bit about you know, the Dreadnoughts in, in, in your Devil's Due universe and, and kind of your thoughts and feelings yeah. about yeah, the dreadnoughts were always just fun. Um, I always tell a little bit of story. Like my uncle is like a total biker, and I, I'd seen, I'd seen in some like, like biker motorcycle club, like, you know, culture, growing like as a, you know, in high school and stuff. I started to like notice all that, and I thought it'd be fun. I, I thought, it was, since we're making the story a little more like, it could be a little older, you know, it wasn't just being written for kids. Like I could throw some more of this actual like biker vibe in here, but it's still got to be Dreadnoughts, still got to be their over-the-top Mad Max type characters, you know, and uh, just enjoy it. I mean, all the villains are always fun to write in anything, so, um, but it was kind of like a little precursor, like Sons of Anarchy wasn't out yet, you know, so it was like, now everyone knows that, you know, you know what Dreadnoughts would really be like. <laughs> but it was always fun to think of like Cobra as this network, you know, you've got this Cobra Commander guy who's got this like subversive domestic terrorism operation and then he partners with like a major arms dealer from overseas and then he partners with like a domestic Viking and I was just like well we were picking up you know in the Marvel continuity several years after the you know team had been disbanded and now Cobra Commander's back I was like well what have the Dreadnoughts been doing this whole time? Zartan doesn't just stop Running, running things, so he's built it up, and now there's national chapters, and that would like that's I guess that was the biggest thing I did with Dreadnoughts is make them a, a officially a nationwide gang. With different, I always envisioned they would just have chapters in every major city, so now they really are their own force, and so one they could give Cobra a run for their money, or if Cobra Commander partners back up with them. It's a really big concern for GI Joe and the powers that be. And I think I think you're the only writer who's ever written a, a Dreadnought series <laughs> in comics. That's hard to uh, believe. Which, uh, <laughs> with, with beautiful covers by uh, uh, Clement Swell, who also went on to do very interesting things. Um, uh, you had a tr good track record of um, getting on some very interesting talent onto the books. Um, can you tell us about that book and, and what what it was that that brought you back to writing uh, a, a GI Joe book? Um, after yeah, a time yeah. away um, as the head show. Mark's referring to Dreadnoughts Declassified. So we, we had started doing these declassified miniseries, so where we just basically go back and get to like really dig into the origin if it had never been totally explained, or slightly update things, you know, like so that we did the Snake Eyes Declassified and G.I. Joe Declassified and um, yeah, Brandon Jerwa did and did the Snake Eyes one and then Larry Hama actually did the G.I. Joe Declassified and Got to expand on his origin story for them more. So, um, we had Scarlet. Shooter, who's now a toy again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then we had, uh, yeah. So, anyway, I, I, we did a great, fun Scarlet one shot by Phil Noto. Um, and then I got to do, yeah, I just Dreadnoughts was one of the obvious ones to do. And I don't remember if I was just like, yeah, I want to do that one, or if, if one of the editors came back and asked me. but. I just thought it was a fun challenge too, because Zartan had the most conflicting backstory of any <laughs> character. The toy car, the, the comic said a couple different conflicting things. The cartoon had its whole thing. There was the whole like, well, in the comics there was like the chameleon DNA references for his disguise abilities, and then there was also the, um, but then there was still holograms, and then the cartoon it was like masks. But he also, like, for a split second, was affected by the sun, and then they just kind of stopped worrying about that. 
And then there was. Gotta sell that toy. The <laughs> color changing yeah. plastic. The file card mentioned all this stuff that was never really brought up later. So I thought, how do I make all that work? And that's, I think that is my, one of my strong suits uh, for my faults. That's one of my strong suits as a writer is putting pieces together and making them work. And like give it, being given a set of toys and making them all fit together. And, and um, so yeah, I think I pulled it off, uh, but it ended up being like the most difficult approval thing I've ever done with Hasbro. Um, not just by coincidence of like ch regime changes and, and who the, the, all of a sudden like here I'm writing the most, you know, morally gray character in the Joe universe and yet all of a sudden getting resistance. Like now for their first time they've ever said to us like, well, the good guys need to be good and the bad guys need to be bad. And, and like, you know, why does Zartan have to have this like messed up childhood that maybe to motivate him? Can he just be a bad guy? And I'm like, it's his origin story. And like, this is, you know, so we managed to still get it out. <laughs> and hopefully uh, some, some people still like it, I think. I love it. That's probably the best one. Yeah, yeah absolutely love that story there. Can you, awesome. can you talk about um, writing stories of different lengths and the, the trade paperback? Packaging and market when when Devil's Due had GI Joe the um, that that you'd collect issues uh, and and you were selling the comics but you were also then selling the, the collections yeah because because the graphic novel business is so so big now and it's starting to get big yeah it was like that was like right when all the bookstores all of a sudden um, mid two thousands. Like a switch flipped, and all all of a sudden, librarians all wanted comics, and the school libraries were like, "Hey, and kids seem to be reading comics more, and it's getting kids to read." And and then comics became like the graphic novels were the fastest growing c component of all of publishing in every bookstore. And that's just when we had the. I think it's also because that's when we had the explosion of like Borders and Barnes and Noble, and, and just manga. being built everywhere. And they were being popping up, and then manga comes in. Tokyo Pop revolutionizes uh, manga in the United States, so they wanted, they just wanted graphic novels. So it had always been, you know, done where you just, after a certain amount of issues, you collect them into a trade paperback, um, and then. Uh, so I think, I think that's, but that with, with the Dreadnoughts Declassified, they were forty-eight page books because we knew we could get them out and have a higher price point and you know within three months get them all out and then boom you've got you know a nice thick trade paperback collection so the G.I. Joe trade paperbacks never really sold like crazy though they're always just like enough to keep like they, they always were way more of a, a, a floppy comic periodical market like the fans that wanted it wanted it now <laughs> uh, I think now you know having it binge bingeable is probably you know, something to the way. Okay. Now people have omnibus collections. We were we were really I think we're credited as some of the earliest omnibus like pioneers back then. Right, like that big Voltron book. Voltron, uh, G.I. Joe versus Transformers, yeah. uh, um, Forgotten Realms, um, and then and then World War Three, which right. I think was forced on you <laughs> because they the Hasbro said that you weren't allowed to to collect them. Um, until the very end. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> and, and it might be, uh, it might feel risky to do a book collecting twelve issues if the market has been used to books collecting four or six yeah. at a time. I don't think we were nervous about that one though, because we that the story was so good, and I knew it, it was like a big epic. Mm. Yeah. It was this uh, that was where I felt more like if you don't want this one, you're crazy. Mm. Like that. That was Mark Powers did such a great job with that. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, it's 2023, uh, Real American Hero is in its uh, 41st year, and um, for, wow. <laughs> <laughs> sorry everyone, um, and uh, for over five years, you were in charge of one major component of G.I. Joe. Um, so this is a broad question. Um, can you reflect on sort of what G.I. Joe is, or where G.I. Joe is uh, now, compared to uh, where it's been, or, or where you, you maybe see it going? 
Uh, that's a really good, hard to answer question. <laughs> like, I mean, there's no question. Like back then, it was it it, it was part of the like just the fabric of pop culture with you know at least with like the younger male demographic in the United States I mean it was it was just massive and then uh, and then we I you know I think I we can take credit for truly giving it the biggest boost it ever had since that first round since that first wave that was a little like hit and miss every time until those comics came along and, and by default that catapulting or catalyzing a whole other 80s retro boom in the comic world at the time that the comic book market was becoming so important to wider pop culture and film and entertainment I think we really pushed and we brought a lot of people back on comic shops they kept they stayed they read other things um, but like since then I mean the comics after us I mean they just kind of kept going you know, I don't think that anything major, amazing, happened because by then, and I wouldn't. That's no like diss on them. That's just it kind of needed. It, it was it, we'd already did it for seven years, so anything after a while it needs to kind of like take a breather and have a big like something to something to have a big oomph to come back. And that was supposed to be those movies, and that didn't work. So there uh, now it's like it's in this. You know. Uh, I think it's in a delicate time where, like, is it going to have a resurgence or is it just going to, like, be its own thing, you know, from its own older previous era? So, you know, now, I mean, now we'll see what happens with the stuff that, <coughs> the stuff is, you know, Kirkman's doing and all that. Um, I mean, if anybody has the, the clout in the entertainment space to bring it back and who uh, has a track record of, you know, being, talented and creative enough to do it. I mean, it's it's definitely that guy. Um, so we'll see. I mean, I have no idea what's going on there. So, I mean, that all looks really fun. The new stuff on uh, Larry's book, that artwork looks incredible. <laughs> so it's an interesting dynamic um, where we are in 2023 with the new Skybound relaunch just on the horizon versus uh, 20, 2001, where it's in this you know, it's a nostalgia project that property's trying to get people in for that energy that they experienced in the 80s for the, the audience in probably their early 20s <laughs> versus yeah. uh, to, uh, that same audience um, now being a little bit, yeah. you know, over their early 20s. It, I think what it was always been such a challenge with that is that you need, you, you can't, just to bring in new people, like if you had to only bring in new people, it would be very difficult. You know, um, you have, but, but it definitely, it doesn't work anymore. It's not strong enough to just bring in the previous crowd. Mm. That's, they, that's not enough to support it either. It has to be, you, you have to do both. You have to really give it the fan service to generate excitement with all those old heads. Um, but there's gotta be some new way. And I, I just kind of think there's been so much of a gap since it was like a big like fervor. There needs to be sort of a, a, a break in like, okay, this is what it was, and here's the new way. And I, I don't know, I'm, I've got some ideas I don't really want to <laughs> give out um, on how I would handle that. Um, but um, unless someone wants to have me do it, <laughs> um, but I think yeah. I mean, it's right now. It's you know, it's just ha kind of hanging out. It's kind of where. I feel like it's kind of like when people were keeping Star Wars alive, you know, in between that long gap between the movies and when it was just like a Dark Horse comic and, you know, there was like a small dedicated, yeah, like fan base having conventions and stuff. And um, we talked a little bit about some of that, that relationship with Hasbro being a bit like, like, like you know, <laughs> and maybe a bit more um, uh, problematic at, at, at times and, and then not maybe quite understanding the, the property. Um, they had a great, great quote about your use of Baroness and Destro. Um, do you remember that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Just literally somebody thought I was like adding like a pimp and a dominatrix into the story. <laughs> it's like, no, it's a profit director. 
But, but you know, beyond, that, beyond that, I think you had some involvement with um, uh, Hasbro in a more creative way. That I, ha I had this story from talking to, to Chris Lai, who was the artist on Arashikagi Showdown, about him you know, being an intern at Devil's Due. And one Friday, Friday night, you, you that went sort of you know, working a bit late. You can't do it and said, Hasbro has asked us to do some designs for this thing called Sigma 6. Can you draw me some things? And we you know, fax them back out to, to them. Can you rem remember that? Um, I don't even remember that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I was doing Sigma 6. I remember him doing them. <laughs> yeah, we were. Uh, yeah, I, I had a side business for a long time where we just started, you know, providing extra service for for Hasbro for all kinds of companies. But they, you know, that was just like this obvious connection. So we did a bunch of art for. Uh, um, I, I had somebody else managing this stuff at that point, but like, we we provided art for a bunch of GI Joe trading cards that Wizards of the Coast did. Um, uh, we did a lot of like some toy design turnaround stuff. Chris Lee did the. Uh, Sigma Six, toy, uh, toy a, lot of the, a lot of those, yeah, yeah. yeah. This, this and they, 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 they would also poach comic talent. You know, just the toy designers would see the comics and be like, "Who is that artist?" And they would just call the artist directly. And that's how like Clement Sauvé got, you know, did like the Renegades, um, and uh, you know, I'm sure a bunch of other artists that I might have been aware of. <laughs> uh, what that, that side business? Uh, what, what was the name of that side business? It was just Devils Do Creative. Okay. Just what I called it. And eventually I partnered with somebody else and it was supposed to be expanded, uh, called it Kanoichi. But then it just ended up being like, at the end of the day, and even after I ended up leaving that company, um, they really were still just doing Hasbro and, and toy stuff. It never became like the expanded agency it was supposed to be. So I should have just kept it as it was <laughs> originally. If any of you have the, the box set of the whole Sunbow DVD, uh, all the episodes on DVD, it's like the two thick plastic clamshells inside the sleeve. On the back it says package design, Kunoichi. So that's like an example of what that later company yeah. did. Um, well, when is our, who's, who's representing the con? When's our end time? Oh, I know there's another panel at two o'clock. So. All right, so we're uh, I, we got we've got time for audience questions. Would anyone like to, David? Yeah. Um, I would like to know a little bit more about the relationship between uh, Devils Do and Hasbro because there's been a lot of dispersed rumors about that relationship. I've spoken with Gerald the Priest. I've spoken with you. There's different levels uh, that you've described to me. Can you just explain to the audience these different levels of Hasbro that you had to uh, deal with and the handling of certain aspects of the property with you, uh, with your relationship? Um, so you had lic the licensing department, which is that's who we technically were interacting with. So they, everyone that like, if you made, you know, My Little Pony, you know, erasers you're going to go through the licensing department but um so which is kind of funny when you think about that because like comics are you're literally creating more fiction and expanding the the fantasy of a massive property so it's we you know it's it's uh i don't even know if they do it that way anymore um because this is they people they didn't really think about comics as much back then and if you know uh so uh yeah there was licensing and then within licensing, there'd be like, you know, the person who's just checking the basic stuff, like make sure there's no like curse words in here or too much, you know, someone's face isn't getting blown off like graphically or something. And, and then there'd be kind of like an art director, the person kind of looking over that too within that department. But then it would also go to like the toy department, like the branding and stuff. and. Um, so then you'd have someone from the actual Joe brand, who's in charge of everything Joe, like looking at it, being making sure they were cool with it, and then they would go to legal, in that legal department, and they would just look for it to, you know, lawyer it up. <laughs> make make <laughs> right. sure that names are okay. Or yeah, they're the ones that make sure, really make sure nothing. <laughs> um, and then uh, every now and then, well, if there's any kind of press or anything like that, then it would go to the PR department, and then. 
you know, when it, like once every six months or something, one of their higher, higher, higher ups looks at it and either is like, this is great or gets mad about something, you know, uh, and that's, that's, you know, it's just any, any licensing situation at a big company is like that. So, um, you, you know, it's, it is usually the general flow is in the beginning. It's a real tedious pain in the ass because everyone's looking at it, everyone's making sure, you know, they get their stamp on it and, and that, you know, that's all, also, it's just, it's, they're all paying extra attention. And then once you get, like, past the first few issues, then it's just a lot easier. And then if a major event's gonna happen, you'll notice, like, you know, all of a sudden people are all starting to comment more. And, you know, actually, I still, this is a quote directly ripped off from Larry. He's like, once you prove that, you, you know, it's successful, when they don't care about it and you make it successful, then they'll come and tell you how to do it right. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions from the audience? That's a curious question. Um, so I was, I was probably in the group that found your comics much later um, than when they were published. But I was just curious because I know I've spoken to Larry before about his military influences of being on active duty. And I was just curious because you wrote some really great stories of the Polar with um, Hawk getting shot in the back and how he, like, for a long time, like, he couldn't talk about it. And it was, like, just how he, his whole life became. Special service. Like, did you have any military influences you got tapped into when you're writing the book? Or um, I, uh, well, I, I was overseeing those stories, but I wasn't directly oh, writing those. But still, uh, no, I, I never, I never served. Uh, I did my stepdad was in the Air Force. I grew up on uh, like Page Manor and Wright Patterson Air Force Base for a while, and I was in Fort Meade, Maryland for a while. So I got like, enough of like the, the kind of like the culture. Um, but like that's why I always made sure to have like a, we had military consultants on there and and uh, you know definitely um, never had any like the super technical military level of detail that Larry puts in those um, more of the I guess more of the fantasy action side of it you know but yeah that's that's about my level of experience. Any other now it's made it's so much easier now to write those kind of stories because you're just it's so much easier to search for that information if you're missing it um but yeah <laughs> anybody else um i want to say thank you you're awesome uh i remember getting reading all the press and all that before it came out being excited and seeing the wizard and all that and i got the first issue the first week and i bought every single issue brand new as soon as it came out but uh, um Thank you. and Zenia and all that, can you talk about that? Like how did Hasbro accept him and how did you pitch him to do two characters? Oh, I didn't have to pitch him at all. Uh, he's talking about Zanya and Kamakura and like characters yeah. that I created. Yeah. That was like the very first issue. That's that's back when like, I don't even think they, I don't even know if they knew that I created those characters. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if they still do. <laughs> so yeah, there, there was no pitching of that at all. So with Zanyo, I mean, what, what made you decide that Zartan should have a daughter? I mean, was there just... Um, I think it was just me thinking like, okay, it's been like, a f it's been several years since the characters are supposed to have been gone. Yeah. So what's, what's changed in the, the span of time? So, and it just was an obvious fun thing to have. So it's changed the dynamic with, with that and an excuse to have a cool, like, you know, like punk rock girl in there <laughs> running around. Yeah. Um, and and uh, probably also just to keep adding, like, a little more female characters into it as well. I mean, G.I. Joe was always way ahead of its time in having a great, like, diverse cast. Like, I think it kind of blows away oh, yeah. almost anything from, you know, previous era. So... Uh, yeah, and then Kamakura was just really, Kamakura was one of those things like how Boba Fett was kind of an afterthought, I think. Like, <laughs> I just wanted, I thought it'd be cool if Snake Eyes graduated into being like, a, like now he's Silent Master. And it's like Hard Master, Soft Master, he's Silent Master. Well, he needs like an apprentice who kind of like is there in his, you know, little isolated, you know, temple or whatever. And, and that was the idea for Kamakura. And I thought, well, who would that be? Oh man, what if it was the kid that wrote the letter to him? You know, what if it was Wade Collins? And and that was pretty much it. Uh, that was the, and I wanted to like uh, make him a ninja, but give him a little more of like the military colors and you know 
to get away from them. Because I knew I was adding another ninja, and I didn't want to give any indications of being like Ninja Force. <laughs> they threw in the joke about never don't go full ninja. Um, yeah. So. Can I ask a, a very specific question? So um, it's you know in your role as as, as publisher and things, you can literally sort of, you know approach your art heroes and ask them to to, to work with you know, and. Um, you brought Larry into the, to the fold, but an interesting one was um, having Michael Golden, who I think did the very last uh, uh, cover to the, um, to the final issue of America's Elite. Can, are you able to talk to, to that experience of um, bringing someone like Mark, uh, Michael Golden? Yeah, only because you asked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Michael, we just always wanted Michael Golden to do a cover. I mean, that, that was like a, an awesome get. And then uh, it was, he did this like, like triple gate fold cover, you know, where like you folded it out, and uh, but that was when the approvals were getting really difficult. So they made us take out like he had to take out guns, had to like change the angle of where the guns were pointing. So it <clears throat> well that, that was one of those like oh I'm really sorry, <laughs> you know. Uh, so there's a there's another version of that out there. If there's a scan anywhere or something, you know, of, like what the what the original cover looked like. Our artists don't like. It, when the licensing company tells them to make stuff less interesting. David. Um, World War III, I thought, was uh, a very ambitious story uh, for your last year, I guess, of publishing G.I. Joe. I felt that it really didn't deliver on what it was advertised as, this world war of the entire planet that Cobra had taken over all of Earth. And it was only done in 12 issues. I felt that maybe there were so many other stories in there. And now Rising Sun has kind of done a lot of uh, fill-in stuff with World War III. What was the uh, process of that? And why did it only have 12 issues? Why couldn't it have other stuff on the miniseries to tell them where, where Snowjob was, where this guy was, what's going on here? Where... Uh, there was. Uh... More like that was when we knew the license was going to end. Yeah. So Hasbro, uh, I think we had to push them to let us do even th that many issues because we kind of had to say like, hey, you've already approved. They basically approved the storyline and then said, well, uh, the license is going to be over. So it's like, well, you guys have approved it and allow and approved marketing and approved advertising to your fans right. for the story. So um, they agreed to let it run its course as like a maxi series and then got to be done. So a lot of stuff, I, I can't say I, I have remember at all like what the plans were beyond that because all I remember is, you know, we had to wrap it up. And so like, that you, during that yeah. process you felt really rushed. Yeah, sure. like we, I mean we were gonna, I know we wanted to kill Cobra Commander. That was, because like, hey, it's the end. Like you're gonna totally retcon this stuff anyway. So, <laughs> and they were like, no, you can't kill him, that's too violent or whatever. So that's why he ends up in like a, spoiler alert, <laughs> he ends up in like a water prison or something. Right. And, uh, and all that, so um, yeah, that's that's it. Fun business answer. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll do one more question from the audience, and I, I think I've got the wrap up question. Uh, anyone else in the audience got a question for Josh? Blitlock? He will, he will, uh, if you're feeling shy, of course, he'll be at the answer is C. <laughs> be in the other room. Sell, selling things, uh, sketching things. Which, so. if, if there are no more, that's just going to segue to my final question. So, anyone? Okay, sure. <laughs> uh, well, I, you had brought up 9-11 um, uh, uh, happening right at the uh, same time that you were publishing the uh, first issue. Was there um, any, uh, any part of uh, that in in trying, trying to integrate uh, world events into uh, what you were uh, uh, writing about at the time? No, that was like the opposite. That meant I definitely couldn't do stuff like <laughs> Like I, I really had wanted to like play up that, uh, like, cause I had Cobra Commander had been gone mm -hmm. for several years. I was like, he's traveling the world using his charisma on all these different, you know, world leaders and terrorist groups and everything else. And now he's back. And he's, you know, will reveal he's formed a lot of these alliances, and it's going to be terrifying, like what he might be able to do now. And then I was like, nope, <laughs> not going to do that. That was already going to be a battle with Hasbro anyway. Like I, I you know, I, I, already, I mean, I wasn't going to try to make it too, too dark and edgy. 
but that even dialed it back more. So, uh, yeah. Josh, what are you working on now? <laughs> uh, what I, have, what yeah. have you been working on? Yeah, currently uh, I have a handful of different projects going on. Um, I have just the 15th anniversary of Mercy Sparks, which is my like supernatural action, horror, comedy, you know, just fun book. Uh, that's uh, got two omnibus collections. It's in the development with MGM right now, um, and we've got. Uh, I'm, I've just finished a new issue of that. I'm drawing the book for the first time after writing it and developing characters for 15 years. Uh, me and Mark Powers, who wrote World War III and used to edit the Joe books, we have a side project called The Encoded. We just did a hardcover collection for that. Um, that's got some intentional, fun homages to some like winks, winks and nods to Joe and Transformers kind of stuff. But it's really more like straightforward, serious sci-fi story about the year 2055. Um, we have, uh, uh, I have this like fantasy, alternate history, ancient Atlantis kind of a, a series called Arc World. Uh, which is like ancient aliens, but it's not about no aliens, it's the ancient stuff and all the mysteries, you know, behind all that. And yeah, I'm working on some other top secret things right now as well. Um, working with some like music, uh, Web3 group, which has been fun, doing some like fun cartoony stuff about these skull characters called Wicked Craniums, and we have like a live action music video tied into it. Um, that, that's been really fun. Um, yeah, so Devil's Do Studios is is the website to go to. I'm over there hanging out. And, yeah. Sign up the email list because I will. I think I will have some stuff coming out that will be exciting for this crowd uh, specifically sometime in the near future as well. And listen to this podcast. <laughs> yeah, so if you like hearing people talk about comics, really getting into the weeds and uh, talking to, to um, comic creators, uh, we're doing a deep dive into the devil's Helping us era. remember all the things we forgot we did. <laughs> Dropping some serious member berries. And, uh, yeah, so we're in, we've been doing a deep dive read through. We're sort of in the middle of the America's Elite era. We're going to cover, uh, we've been covering all of the Larry Hammer ARA issues. And yeah, so going to do a big episode about 301 when that drops. Um, so, yeah, follow us on the, the socials or head on over to talkingjoe.co.uk, which is the website to find out more. I've got um, business cards, which I'm calling miniature art prints, <laughs> which uh, have got like that art on the on the back. Um, so if you if you've not got one of those, um, just yeah, pop on over and I'll, I'll give a hand. It's been fun out. listening to these interviews with like people that worked with with me or for me, like you know way back then too. Just hearing. One, it's funny because you hear where you're like, you're, you, well, you learn something and you're like, you just hear from their perspective. <laughs> and it's like, it's just, it's just fun to hear like, oh, oh, when I was focusing on this the eight hours a day and four hours of your day, we're just only doing that. So it's just interesting to see. And it's funny too when you're like, you, you, when you hear like someone's completely remembering something backwards, you're like, no, that is not the order that happened in. And then I'm like, oh God, what have I said that it's like backwards? <laughs> we all need to, but it's fun, that's fun because you listen to those and you like kind of corroborate everything. It's like listening to a Larry Hama interview followed by a Jim Shooter interview and you're like, I just don't match up the same. <laughs> Uh, head to Josh's table uh, where he's uh, uh, sketching and signing and selling books. Uh, sign up for his stuff. And thank you, Josh Blaylock. Thank you.